Um, the reason I'm using the microphone, you usually use a microphone. We are video, we are taping this meeting. I've gotten a couple of uh, requests from people that could not be here that um, the information be made available. The best way for us to do that is to uh, videotape it and post it on YouTube. It'll also be available on Township channels, which will get the information out. Um, Let me say, if anyone else has any comments or questions or ask anything, make sure to use the microphone, right. either, either the handheld one or the one at the podium, or any mic. So I'll be passing, once, once we go through the presentation, I'll be passing around the microphone for people to ask questions. And um, So uh, my name is Stephen Klein. I'm your Township Commissioner. Thank you for coming out. Um, with me today is uh, Chief Bill Kelly, who's the Chief of Police, and Deputy Chief Livingood. Um, he is the Deputy Chief in charge of the Detective Unit. Uh, we are going to go through a slideshow to discuss the issues and um, things that the police department have been uh, looking into in your neighborhood for probably the last 15 months, criminal, uh, you know, any criminal activity, and they're going to describe to you all the different uh, definitions, the different types of crimes, some of the connections that they've been trying to make, some of the efforts they've been uh, making and coordinating with other municipalities from Delaware County all the way up to Bucks County for some of these things. Uh, a couple ground rules. And they're very small ground rules, but because this is a, some of the information is sensitive, I want to make sure that um, the police department will review the, the, the videotape before it actually gets published. Um, and the reason that is is because if names are talked about or if they go through there and they realize that some information shouldn't actually be out there, um, nothing in the slideshow can, can be, nothing in the slideshow is going to be edited. It's just a matter of, in the course of conversation, if they discover that there's something that they shouldn't have in there, it will be edited out. So I just want to make sure everybody's clear about that. If a resident brings up something that they feel is sensitive, names, whatever, we will also look to edit that out also, but only for sensitive issues. Um, we're going to, Deputy Chief Living Good's going to give us a presentation. We'll go through the whole presentation, and then we'll uh, take whatever time it takes to answer your questions and try to address your concerns. Um, first off, I'd like to, uh, Mary Berkowitz is here, and it was her husband, Steve, that contacted me um, with his concerns about things that were going on uh, in the neighborhood and suggested to me that I should have a neighborhood meeting. So you know, Steve couldn't be with here with us because of some health issues, um, but I did want to thank him for uh, making the request to me, and I think it was a great idea. So with that, I'm going to pass it off to one of these gentlemen. Um, I'll throw it on the floor and see which one gets it first. Commissioner, let me just say that we have water over there in case anybody wants some, and also some cups. So if you want to get some, certainly um, certainly you're welcome to do that. Normally we would make the commissioner pay for that. But, but, but since, uh, since uh, John and I are your neighbors, we fear we'll spring for it this time, Commissioner. All right. Okay, thank you, Chief Kelly. Um, what I'd like to do tonight, let me just start off here. First of all, I'd like to welcome everybody, too, and um, as the Chief said, I am one of your neighbors. I live on Lindsay Lane, um, so I share a lot of the same concerns and um, things that you all do. Um, whatever happens in your neighborhood is not that far away from mine, and a little, little later in the presentation, I will explain to you how there's crime that crosses over those borders and way beyond that. But specifically, we're going to talk about some crime that occurred in my neighborhood and, and far-reaching areas that has also occurred in yours. So the area that we're really going to focus on tonight is the area that you're most interested in, and that is, of course, the area between Huntington Pike um, to Morden Road to Meeting House Road to Mill Road, that little rectangle piece that sits in there where most, I suggest, or I probably guess most of you are from, is of most interest to you. But we also know that crime knows no boundaries. So you need to be interested in not only what is happening there, but what is happening well beyond those boundaries, because it has a very much effect on you as well. I know you're not interested in these definitions, but it is necessary to understand how we classify crimes, just to have a brief primer on them. So they are up there, and a suggestion has already been made by your commissioner that we add these definitions to our website. We'll be showing you the crime mapping piece on there, and we are going to put these definitions right in that part of the, um, of the web page. So you'll know exactly what it is that you want to look up. 
That hasn't happened yet, but at his request, we are going to take care of that. Burglary is the one that really affects you most, I think, and one that you're very, very interested in. It's a crime that is one of the major concerns of us as a, as a, um, a police department out here in the suburbs. It's one of the most serious crimes that we face. We got some other things as well. We got a robbery now and then. We'll show you that. Um, we even have a homicide and serious crimes like aggravated assault. But this is the one that most homeowners are really concerned about, interested in, and one of the things that we really concentrate on. Robbery, of course, is whenever something is taken from somebody by threat, force, or um, threat of force. So let's start with robbery. There's only one, and by the way, the time frame we are talking is January 1st, 2014, up until yesterday is when we put this off, finish this thing off. So there was one robbery that occurred within your little area, 1300 block of Glenbrook Road, and it was not a stranger type of crime, but it's actually a gentleman that lived there. He's away in Florida. His son and the son and his grandson were staying in the house. And he wanted to make sure that his grandson was out by the time he got home. So the father um, told the son he had to leave. And there was a confrontation between them. And it ended up that the son, the 23-year-old grandson, I should say, so I don't confuse you even more, um, he put a knife to his father's throat and took his grandfather's car at point of knife away from him and uh, fled the area. We responded to that call. Uh, we went in pursuit of that vehicle. Um, it was a high-speed pursuit. And so as to not endanger citizens and the private public, private and public, um, we abandoned that pursuit because we knew who was in the car and we knew what car it was. He was, of course, captured in Philadelphia without father incident, without anybody getting hurt. He is currently in custody, has had a preliminary hearing, and is waiting trial. So that's the only robbery, fortunately, that has occurred in your area in that time period. This is a map of where it is, and that is actually a screenshot of the mapping, crime mapping facility that is on our web page. We're going to show you that live in a little while. So burglaries, let's talk about these. Burglaries and attempted burglaries, we consider them both to be the same. And... Um, I just want to walk through those because you might think that they are all connected and therefore really a, a, a indication, if you will, of a continuing crime trend. If we start out with the one in the 1500 block of Mill Road, um, there was no force. The people were away in South America for an extended period of time. You can see that's between um, April 29th and May 14th. And um, they were gone, and they had a number of workers in the house at the time, and it seems almost certain that one of those workers was the um, culpable person. We have done a considerable amount of investigation on that. We continue to look into that case, and um, have had all those workers in and, and talked to all of them. Um, so that case is un unsolved at this point in time, but I would suggest to you that it is probably connected to nothing else that you're going to see here. Then we had an attempt at burglary in the 900 block of Morden Road. In this case, it was a smashed glass in a rear French door to the house. They just smashed the living daylights out of it. They did not get into the house, even though they did a considerable amount of damage. And uh, fortunately for us, they cut themselves in the process. Now, I guess evidence techniques, as good time to mention it as any, have changed over the years. We used to think solely in terms of fingerprints. But now, one of the primary things we're looking for is DNA. And we can get DNA rather readily, and it doesn't have to be from blood. It doesn't have to be from body fluids. We can get what's called plain touch DNA. So in most cases, if we have to make a choice between collecting fingerprints and collecting DNA, we will easily decide on the DNA. It is much more likely that we're going to get um, evidence of value from that as opposed to the fingerprints, much more likely. Any DNA that we collect is sent to the state police lab, and I will tell you that this is the problem. One of the pitfalls in the entire process is that it takes us about a year to get those results back. That's just the way it is. Um, you can imagine all these police departments across the Commonwealth are submitting their evidence on all kinds of crimes, and it just overwhelms the lab, and it runs just about a year 
is what it takes us to get those results. What we will get from them when we do get it will be if it is in fact DNA, if it is in fact human DNA, and they will give us a profile on it, and they will run it against a database which is a nationwide database called CODIS. And in that CODA database is anybody who has been arrested, convicted of a serious felony crime. In addition to that, all unsolved crimes, the DNA that wasn't identified to anybody sits out there, and as a new person is arrested, convicted, and their DNA gets added to the database, it is queried against all those unknown samples. So even if we don't get a name attached to this, um, that will not be um, for naught because that sample will remain there and will continue to be checked as new samples are submitted from known subjects. So DNA is a very important thing of what we do. Then we have um, the 1000 block of Dale Road. Now those initials underneath there, which really don't seem to mean a whole lot to you, but notice it's through an unlocked back door. We're going to talk about these in a little while, but we call them the late night occupied house burglaries. And basically they amount to this, that the persons who are committing the crimes enter that home through an unlocked door or window. They don't use force. They know that these are done in the middle of the night. And if you look at the time period on that one, it's between 12.30 a.m. to 6.15 when the people got up. And that's what's usually the case. They wake up, they go downstairs, then they discover my pocketbook's gone. I left it on the kitchen table. It's gone. Or our laptop computer is gone. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about those, but that burglary right there on Dale Road is positively connected to those. Um, then we have two in the um, 1300 block of Lenore, right across the street from one another. Um, through an open window on the first floor, the gentleman um, went out for the day. Um, he left the window up a little bit for ventilation, and that's all it took. The criminals raised that window up, went in, and stole cash out of a bureau. Now, whether somebody was watching him leave, we do not know, don't have the answer to that. Um, and we really don't have enough information on that to connect it to any other trends that we see going on. The next one on Lenore is a back door was pried. These people were away um, over a weekend, I believe. And they came back, and the back door was pried open rather severely, cash, jewelry, there was a couple of watches taken. And when we did our neighborhood canvas, there was um, one of the residents saw a white male seen in the area with a backpack on. So we are continuing to explore that. And you remember I mentioned earlier about that robbery over on Glenbrook, um, the white male that was involved there that's currently in jail. Um, certainly, we are looking at him as a possible person of interest that we'd want to uh, question about that. This is a map of these burglaries. Again, it's a screenshot from our web page. Now, I'll tell you right now that you see that one dot doesn't look like the others. That's because we had to add it manually. Right now, there's a couple of problems with this web page. It doesn't always load all the data. So we're um, working to fix that. It is updated on a weekly basis now, and it should be up to date. And what it does give you is a pretty good snapshot, an idea of what's going on in your area. It will not be 100% accurate if you're trying to count them, um, but it will give you an idea of what's going on. And when you see, when we show you the demo of this, you'll see that if you click on any one of those balloons, it'll give you a little blurb with the crime, the um, case number, the date, time, and the actual location. This is a list of some other burglaries which I think you should be concerned with. Um, first of all, there was a burglary that occurred on the 7th of February in Lower Moreland, Burnett Road. And um, that was a second floor win uh, window entry. The criminals brought with them a small collapsible aluminum ladder, put it up to the second floor. The people had their alarm set. And um, they, by making entry through the second floor window, they bypassed that alarm completely. It never activated. Only the first floor of the house was alarmed. And um, criminals knew that. And that's the way they got in. Uh, they, took, um, foot, uh, they took jewelry and some cash. And you see there's two sets of footprints. We got a lucky period of time here for us when we're doing investigations. And that's when there was snow on the ground 
particularly when that snow was still compactable and left identifiable or kind of um, footprints that you could really see the impressions of them pretty well. Um, the next one we have is um, 1400 block of Londonderry. And I'll show you in a minute a map of where that is. I don't know if you're familiar with it or not. But if you went and crossed Huntington Pike on Morden Road, um, you would see that that would be probably the second street, I believe, that you would come to on your right, kind of across from the mother house there. And it goes in. It's a cul-de-sac street. This is the house at the dead end of that cul-de-sac. And um, the people, that was a Saturday night on the 7th. Um, they, had, they were out for the evening for dinner. And uh, when they came home, they found out that somebody had smashed in right through the double-glazed sliding glass doors in the rear of their home. Now, it was interesting that the footprints, two sets of footprints again, remember the lower Portland job, um, those two sets of footprints came in through a field from uh, another street right next door, Larmer, Larmer Road or Larmer Street, which is a circular street that comes in, loops around, and goes back out, um, which, of course, indicates to us that the criminals either parked there or they um, got picked up and dropped off there. Um, They are similar, well, without getting into too much detail, in the lower Moreland job, one of them does not match the other two that we have. The other one is a lug sole, like a um, either uh, uh, work boots that have that typical diamonds in the middle and the lugs around the outside, and it's an extremely common pattern. But um, that is in both of those jobs, but there's two sets, and um, so that's of significance. Um, this house on Londonderry had an alarm. They had it set, and the criminals knew that when they smashed through that door, it activated the alarm. It was audible inside the house, and they went ahead and went to the master bedroom and still stole jewelry and cash and got out before the police could respond. Now, I don't know how many of you have alarms, and certainly they are a good thing. Um, our policy or what we preach is that everything you do to protect your house has a cumulative effect. So if you lock your doors and windows, that's a start. Uh, but certainly there's more that you can do, and alarm is certainly one of those things. What we have done, what we recommend to people to do, is to contact your alarm company if you have them and tell them you do not. Normally what happens is if your alarm goes off, the alarm company calls you and says, uh, do you have the right code number? Is this a founded alarm, or did you accidentally set it off, or got, you had it set, et cetera? And the criminals know that as well. And we believe that they rely on that phone call as their first warning. Okay, the phone's ringing in the house. That's the alarm company. Guess it's time for us to go because their next call is to the police. So what we are suggesting to you is that if you have an alarm system, you contact your alarm company and tell them you don't want that call to come to the house to see if it's a false alarm. You want it to go right to the police department. You want to dispatch police immediately without any delay. In return... We are not currently billing anybody for false alarms. We have a false alarm ordinance in a place, and, uh, but we have kind of suspended that. And uh, unless somebody is really out of control with their alarm going off like three times a week, uh, just because they, are, you know, wanna, they don't know what they're doing, um, that's the only time we'd even consider imploring that alarm, the ordinance rather. So I would suggest to you that if you do that, and if you contact us and let us know that you've done that, we'll make sure that you do not get fined for false alarms. Um, I think that's an important step that you can take as far as kind of stepping up the value of the alarm system that you've invested in in your house. Um, the next one is a 600 block of Morden Road. And uh, again, those three that you see right there we think are very much connected, committed by the same people. Um, shoulder at rear door. This happened a few days later. Um, after the one on Londonderry, if you had a real good arm, you could probably throw a stone from one house to the other. Um, and um, there's a rear French door in that house. It appears to be what we call shouldered. In other words, just brute force put, put against the door, and it pops the jam, and then it goes. Heavy ransacking. They were in that house a long time. It took a lot of cash and jewelry. Um, two sets of footprints, once again, coming in from that same road, Armour Road. Um, so without question, I can tell you those three are um, connected one to another. In addition to that, um, this past Saturday night, Upper Dublin Township, they had one of these burglaries that occurred the exact same way. Again, two sets of footprints, um, tripped the alarm, 
same thing, same MO as we call it, method of operation was employed in that. So at least those four burglaries are really connected one to another. So you can see we're talking about a pretty widespread area. Now, this is not the first time that we've seen that type of pattern. Um, we've investigated those burglars before. Um, we've arrested the same people several times now for committing these types of burglaries. And um, we are looking at that same group again. We feel pretty certain that um, at least some parts of that group are connected to these crimes and are responsible for them. So that's where we're focusing our, our um, efforts, our investigative efforts at the moment. You have, um, some of you have commented, you've, you have seen an increased police presence in your area. And we have a lot of things going on in response to, um, to these burglaries, which I'm, I'm really not going to be able to discuss with you. But you trust me when I tell you that we are sparing no expense. We are putting a lot of resources into catching these criminals and stopping these guys before they commit these crimes. And we're doing a lot of different things on a lot, a lot of different fronts. But one of them is what you've seen, and that's probably an increased um, presence in your neighborhood. We believe that there's other jobs in Springfield, possibly in um, Philadelphia. And we've checked with the other jurisdictions where this group hit before, particularly Lower Marion Township. They have not seen it yet. But they, um, when we, we described the crime to them, they said, well, we know they're coming. We're going to put the information out to, to our guys as well. So. This kind of shows you where those crimes are. Whoops. I thought that was a laser there, Nathan. Laser is a big one in the middle. Okay, gotcha. So if this is Huntington Pike going down here and Morden Road going across, that is the 600 block of Morden Road. That's that one right there. This is the one on Londonderry, and I apologize. The map colors are kind of washed out on the screen, but I just want to give you a flavor for that, and you can see over in your neighborhood where those are. Again, these definitions. We're required to use something called the Uniform Crime Reporting System. This is a system that was devised by and maintained by the FBI. And every crime that occurs in Abington Township is counted and classified the exact same way that that same crime would be counted and classified in Philadelphia or Sacramento, California, or any other community in this entire country. All of us in Pennsylvania have to report our crimes every month to the Pennsylvania State Police. They, in turn, pass that on to the FBI. And I don't know if you ever heard of a publication called Crime in the USA or Crime in Pennsylvania. Um, they are available on the Internet. You can look at our crime statistics um, for Abington. You can look at crime statistics for any community in the entire country. In fact, I'll show you a little later how you can get to some of that information right from our website. But I can tell you this, that our crime statistics here in Abington stack up extremely, extremely well with other communities that are like-sized with us and that have similar characteristics. Now, it is never possible to do an exact comparison of statistics between communities. There are just too many variables. For example, we border the city of Philadelphia. We know that's an issue for us. We also have a large shopping center. We have Willow Grove Park Mall. That draws a lot of crime in itself. So you have to consider all those factors with, with, other than just saying, well, this is the same size as that community, therefore they should have the same amount of crime. There's a lot of variables that go into it. But however you measure it, however you stack it up, I would tell you that our crime rates are very, very um, uh, favorable to others that you would care to compare us with. Um, so that's larceny theft. Basically, it is um, stealing something. That's what it amounts to. And then um, we also have a definition down the bottom there. It's called property crime because some of the statistics, some of the comparators you're going to look at do not break down auto theft, do not break down burglary um, theft and theft separately. They lump them all under something called property crime, and you'll see that statistic used sometime. That's what that means in case you see it. All right, here's the thefts, and I want to talk about them for a minute. Um, 1300 block of Warner Road, and you can go right down the list there. Again, these start at the beginning of, um, of um, last year, 2014. Now, the thefts and recovery from mailboxes, they're all obviously connected. All those things on the, th on the 19th of March, 2014, we believe all occurred at the same exact time. 
Um, there was a lady who was out walking. I don't know if she's here tonight, but um, she was out, I think, walking her dog, and she found an envelope laying in the, on the street. She picked it up, and it was a ripped open envelope and had a check in it. Uh, she found out that it belonged to one of her neighbors, so she contacted that neighbor, and she said that I was in my mailbox, and it was stolen out of her mailbox, ripped open, nothing taken out of it. And the other stuff that was recovered was the same exact thing. We did not know about the thefts until the mail was recovered, and that's how we really found those thefts. They were not previously reported. The top one, the UPS package was. The package was delivered. You know, you can track that with UPS now. Never received, and it was stolen. Some more of these. And um, you can see these are obviously pretty isolated incidents. The top one, um, boyfriend, the girl loaned her car to her boyfriend. He, in turn, loans it to a friend of his. He decided he wasn't going to bring it back, and um, we eventually recovered it for them. But because of the connection, giving it away and whatnot, really couldn't prosecute anybody for that. Um, the one on 1400 block of Bryant, the cell phone accidentally dropped outside. Um, young lady thinks that she got out of her car, dropped her cell phone, and left it there. You know, didn't realize she had dropped it, and somebody must have picked it up and taken it. And then we have that snowblower that was stolen from a rear yard on the 1400 block of Huntington Road, Huntington Pike, rather. Some of those thefts. And by the way, when I show you the, um, show, and I'll demonstrate to you live, but there is a list on the right hand, on the left hand side. And it is chronological. The older ones are at the bottom. The newest ones are at the top. And you can arrow up and down. Theft from vehicles. This is another crime that's of very much concern to residents. Um, we see a tremendous amount of this throughout the township. Um, all too often, but not always, as you'll see in one case here, um, cars are left unlocked and valuables are stolen out of them. Um, so we have that in the uh, 1200 block of Rack. And then we go down to Warner Road. Um, that was a kind of work van, and there were power tools that were taken out of it, a number of them. Unfortunately, it was left unlocked. Um, the next one down, 1400 block of, of Bryant, there was a smashed vent window, reached in, unlocked it, and again, stole a lot of um, power tools. So we have actually um, are charging somebody with those crimes, and I'll get to that in a second. Um, 1300 block of Carroll, Cal there's a... Um, wallet and change taken from an unlocked vehicle, and 900 block of Dale Road, theft of loose change from unlocked vehicles. So again, we see a tremendous amount of that, and I know uh, Commissioner Klein has implored you many, many times. I get his newsletters too, and uh, please, your cars, your houses, everything, lock them up. Don't leave anything in plain view in them, and lock them anyhow. This is an intelligence bulletin. This is something we put together to advise our people of things that are going on. And it's a little hard to read up there, <clears throat> but it is a list of work vans that had, had tools stolen out of them. Now, the two that you just saw there were not included in this particular list at this time because these all happen within a couple of day period. They're all in Abington Township, none of them right in your area. But the two that I showed you um, a couple minutes ago are very much connected to these. The way that we connected all these together is, first of all, there was an arrest made on these. I don't think we put that on here, but no. So an arrest was made on these. We had developed some suspects, worked with some other jurisdictions, and between Plymouth Township, Springfield Township, and us, we arrested two brothers and another guy, and they actually had a girl with them as well. There's something that we call suspicious occurrences. There may be some things that you thought, well, maybe that was a burglary or maybe that was a theft. Um, but sometimes it doesn't quite fit the definitions that I showed you. And we consider these to be mostly suspicious occurrences. Um, in the ones where you see the IRS mail fraud, what that amounts to is those people received mail from the IRS that was addressed to somebody with an Hispanic name, um, but at their address. And it is very much a part of a fraud. We see a tremendous amount of IRS fraud that is going on right now. And this is one of the scams that they use. And um, so that's what they are all connected with. The one on the 1300 block of Carroll Road, um, that lady um, thought that somebody had attempted to break into her garage door. It turns out the garage door is pretty old, and one of the rollers had come off of the track inside and really caused the garage door to tilt a little bit and jam. But when we checked that, when our officers went out there, there were no pry marks, 
that there was no evidence that anybody had um, g tried to get in there or that it was in any way an attempt at burglary. Next one's an IRS fraud again. Um, the one on the 1200 block of Glenbrook Road. That was a suspicious occurrence where we believe a transient criminal, um, he stopped at the woman's house. He said, there's a dent in your car. I will fix it right here for you, give you a good price. It's a scam we have seen before in a number of cases. We followed up on that, and um, we um, weren't able to, we developed some names because of some contacts that we had and intelligence. We showed some pictures of those um, individuals to our victims. They really couldn't identify anybody. The phones, numbers that he had left didn't go any place, and um, we came up dry on that. Yes, The, what, you had a dent guy? No, I was working in my garden. And my dent was out of the house. I came back. And this guy was standing between the car and the open garage door. And he said, hello, hello. I'll help you. He said, I was driving past my swing hat. Some dents in the car. Mm. There was no way he could see from the, from the road. There was no dents. Mm. So I said to him, no, there's no dents. It's um, a crime we've seen a couple times. In addition to that, they like to prey on people. Could you go over that again? There's no way I would say Oh, I'm sorry. I should have handed you this. I'm sorry. That's just repeat what you said. Yeah, I don't want to interrupt. Okay. Just real quick. There's a phone down there. I saw a gentleman between my car and open garage door looking around saying hello, hello. I asked him what he wanted. He said he was driving past and saw some dents in my car and he could repair them for me at a very reasonable price. I said, uh, thank you, I don't need any help. Um, get out of here. And um, he was a Hispanic gentleman, about 5'8 or 5'9, um, fairly well built. Stucky uh, with short dark hair. When was that, sir? Um, this summer. Last year? Yeah. Okay. Um, we've seen that in a number of cases. In addition to that, um, those same people have been a number of times down around Baderwood Shopping Center and Best Buy, not Best Buy's, um, Bed Bath and Beyond. They like to hang in those parking lots. Uh, we've caught a couple of them doing it. Um, we believe them to be uh, self-proclaimed gypsies, and um, we have fined them. We have tried to stop them, and their ploy is typically not to get into your house, that particular brand of people. Of course, I would never trust anybody um, not to get into your house, but um, they tend to like to rip you off on the body work that they do. In many cases, people, they want to fix dents that the people didn't even have when they started you know, they made a dent and uh, they were going to fix it. But so, okay. Um, the last one, of course, is just a straight out criminal mischief. Uh, some more of these. Uh, in the top one, that's a very much like an IRS um, type of scam. But in addition, the people received mail and a traffic citation from somewhere up in New York, I believe. Um, they had never been there. They had no idea how it happened. Uh, but obviously, somebody was registering their car and using that as their address, this gentleman's house. There was a suspicious activity report here. Homeowner saw a white car, two males standing next to it. Our officers went out there to check them out. They were gone on arrival. We didn't find any criminal activity in the area around that time period. Had nothing to connect it to. Then this last one on the Noor. Um, that's this year, January 9th. Um, the storm door, the, the knob was off of the storm door. The inner knob had fallen down between the storm door and the inside door. But that's all we had. There was no footprints around the outside. They had not gone around the house. There was no pry marks, no attempts to enter the house on the door, on the inside door. 
Um, so therefore, using our definition, that does not rise to an attempt at burglary, and we did not classify it that way. But it is a suspicious occurrence nevertheless. Um, let me see if I can do a live demo for you real quick of this. Okay. This is our web page. This is um, abingtonpd.org. And um, if you just put Abington Township or abington.org, you're not going to get us. You can also link to this from the township's web page. There's a direct link. But if you want to come directly into our Abington Police Department web page, this is where you go. Now, there's a number of things that are available to you here, but what I'm going to show you right now. If you go up here to the top, you'll see resources, and you go down there to crime maps is the first one. This brings up a little table that asks you, when do you want to ask about? And if we just choose to ask about, well, let's go back to the same period of time we've been talking about. So we go back to 2014. I changed the month to January. Go back to January 1st, and then I want to end that today, so I just click on that. Now, here it gives me a table, a drop-down table, of all the crimes, and included in there are the ones we've been talking about. So if I wanted to look at, for example, burglaries, I would just do that and then hit search and filter data, and it will bring up a table with all the burglaries. Now, that is all over the township, so that doesn't mean a whole lot to you. Um, so what I do is I just move the map over a little bit. I see Meadowbrook there. That's kind of where I'm looking for. And then I take this thing and I just zoom in on that area and continue it to drag it until you get to exactly where you're trying to get to. And you'll see that where I am right now, and I can go in farther, um, looks exactly like the one that I gave you the screenshot of. Um, if you click on any of those dots, it opens up a little block, a dialogue box that will tell you about that particular crime, um, where it is. Um, that's a thousand block of Dale Road, Meadowbrook, PA, and it's a burglary. And it gives you the case number. I'm sorry, it doesn't give you the case number. It gives you the, the date that the crime occurred. Again, over here on the left side, this is in chronological order. So the most recent one um, that's going to be on this map is up here at the top, and um, you can see that one right here that I mentioned in the 600 block of Morden Road, and I can click on that and do the reverse. It takes me out to that block if you want to look at where that was. Here's one that's happened since then. That was on the 11th of the month, and that takes me to that one, and that one happens to be in Meadowbrook Apartments. So you can go ahead and use this, and as I indicated before, I would recommend that you don't rely on this for a complete and total list of what's going on, but it is a good indication of the various crimes that are going on in your township. Um, it is on this page that we're going to add those definitions that the commissioner asked about. Pardon me? Okay. Can you hear me better now? Um, we're um, going to add those definitions on this page. So again, it's a, um, not a complete total listing. 
It's a bulk uploaded um, page. In other words, this is a, not a real-time transfer from a records management system directly into this. They have to be manually bulk uploaded, and it occurs at least once a week. It's going to be up there. was down for a period of time, but it's now back up. So, Ms. Lehman? Oh, yeah, yeah. Proprietary software, or I mean, do you have the ability to manipulate the software, or is it store bought in software? So, because what we'd like is, if possible, is to choose things or have a selection that said all, so we could see everything all at once. Um, our vendor who made our software, made our web page, our web designer, um, gave us this product. I don't know where she obtained it from. We can certainly see that. I can see where that would be of interest to be able to see multiple crimes at one time, but right now it can't be done. So, but we'll certainly look into that. Um, so that's the, and we could continue to do this with various crimes and whatnot, but I want to show you a couple of other things on here. In fact, let me go back to the PowerPoint. And we'll come back to that. That's good. Okay, so that's where we were, and we just looked at resources and crime maps. We'll come back to that again, and we'll show you a little bit more that you can do with our web page other than just a crime maps. Um, some other items that you had asked that we discussed tonight, and I just want to try to cover some of those as best I can. Um, the Meadowbrook Apartments, let me skip over that one because that's a hyperlink going to take us right back to the web page, and I don't want to jump right back there yet, but I will do it before we leave this page. Um, and basic investigative procedures. Um, there is no uh, textbook basic investigative procedures that you do in each and every crime scene. It varies from scene to scene, from situation to situation, from crime to crime, depending on the circumstances. Certainly in that case where we had blood, DNA is indicated there, we would certainly be considering DNA there. When we have footprints in the snow, that's something we always consider as evidence. We would photograph them. If they're defined enough, we would consider casting them um, as evidence. So that's not something you do in every single crime scene. We always think in terms of the basics, like fingerprints, and now more so than, than other times, the um, uh, plain touch DNA or, or DNA from other sources. Um, and then there's a number of things that we do at the crime scene itself. But our investigation is only beginning at the crime scene. It is really what takes place afterwards, later, in the days, weeks, and months even afterwards, that is really the in-depth investigation that we do. Um, we check with other agencies. We share intelligence with everybody else. In fact, Abington's kind of a leader in that arena. We run a list here that has about a 1,000 law enforcement agencies, members, I shouldn't say agencies. There's multiple members from one agency on there. Um, but we have about a 1,000 members on that, and any time we have a serious crime like that, we post what information we have out there to see if anybody else has had it. In addition to that, if we're looking for a resource, we put it out on that list. We've had a lot of success for that. Um, once a month, we hold a crime-sharing meeting here in Abington Township. We invite all our surrounding agencies to come in, and they all come in. We have a tremendous turnout for that. We have about 45 to 50 people every single month come to that. Those are just some of the basic procedures we use. We have used some very advanced um, electronic surveillance techniques. We continue to do that. Um, I'm going to show you we have followed people in planes. Um, I'll show you a picture of that in a minute. Um, somebody asked about the prioritization of our investigations. Do we prioritize them? And does, is that dependent on the value of the property stolen, the seriousness of the crime? And yes, those are all factors we take into consideration. We also take into consideration what's the likelihood that we're going to be able to solve this crime. Because like anybody else, we have limited resources. We don't have, you know, a million dollars to spend. Um, we have only so many detectives. Every single one of them is carrying a caseload of at least 20 to 25 open cases at any given time. 
And you get beyond that, you really can't do justice to the ones that you are investigating. So I don't like them to have any more than that. So we have to limit the number of cases that we're assigning to them. Every single case cannot be assigned for investigation. And we have to pick and choose and use those resources wisely. I can tell you that there aren't many burglaries that don't get assigned for investigation, however. Like I told you to start out with, that's what we consider in the suburbs here an extremely serious offense. And uh, we devote a lot of resources to burglaries and make sure that we give them the due their worth. Um, but we do prioritize investigations. It only makes sense to do that. Is information withheld? We don't purposely withhold information. Um, only if, it, if for some reason it would jeopardize um, an ongoing investigation or future investigations. I told you a little while ago, I couldn't share with you all the things that we do, are doing for this current trend, and that's for that very reason. It just wouldn't make good sense um, for me to do that. But other than that, um, we are, we, we, you know, sometimes we know when our officers go around uh, following a crime, knock on the door, and people say, what happened here? Well, we can't really talk about it. We'd rather they don't do that. We'd rather they tell the people, here's what happened. It was a burglary. Here's what had happened. So that um, if they have information, we'll be able to get that information. Um, and, uh, it, you know, sometimes I guess that's something that officers get in their head. Well, I shouldn't be telling this information out. They don't want to share it and everything. But uh, we try to um, refute that as best we can. Neighborhood canvas. Um, always done on burglaries. We documented on burglaries. This was, um, we've had some discussions about this in the past. Um, I can tell you that um, probably today we do a better job of documenting these. We've always done them. We document them better than we did in the past as part of the burglary reports. And um, if it's not on the burglary report, it has to be on the investigative report. But we put who the people were, what doors they knocked on, were they home, if they were home or not home, and uh, what did they see. And uh, so we know if we have to go back again or whatnot. Um, getting back to victims. A um, couple things on this. First of all, um, let me come back to that one. And let me go back to the one at the top, and I'll click on that hyperlink again. Okay, we're, we're back on our web page, and I told you there's some other things I wanted to show you there, and I'm going to go to resources again, and um, a couple things here. First of all, um, alarm registrations. And I'll just bring that up real quick. You're not required to register your alarm. I told you that we have more or less suspended our billing for false alarms, um, but we strongly suggest that you do register your alarm. That allows us to keep in contact with you as well as to know what alarm system you have. If it goes off, you're away for the weekend, continually rings, we know who we're able to contact about that. It's not going to cause you to get billed or not billed any less than it would otherwise. We are not charging for this registration. This is completely free to do this. So we would urge you to register your alarm. Go back to that. Solicitation permits. I know from past conversations that you're extremely concerned with solicitors in your neighborhood. We understand that. And um, if this top line, if you click that, it will tell you who has a valid current solicitation permit in Abington Township. You'll see that in the month of March, there is none. There are no solicitors, commercial solicitors out there that are allowed to be knocking on anybody's door. We would ask you to call anytime you see any solicitors out there. We will come out and check them out. If they are people that are permitted, permitted by law, such as political, religious canvassers, which, um, of course, we can't restrict, they um, can certainly, um, we'll check them out. shouldn't be a problem at all. We'll send them on their way. And if... Um, they are a commercial one. We'll make sure they have a permit. And if not, we will absolutely cite them, as we have done many, many times. We have a zero-tolerance policy here. We don't let people go except in extraordinary circumstances. And we have, I don't know, Chief, how many would you say, um, a number of them that we have issued a citation for um, for this. Um, the, the permits for the commercial people, um, we make it as high as we possibly can without being unreasonable. The, the highest number we felt we could get away with by law, it's $100 per solicitor per month. 
So if Verizon wants to send 10 people in here, that's $1,000 per month that they're going to have to pay for those people. And if we catch them otherwise, they get cited. Call 911. Yeah, we're going to go through, yeah, I mean, we'll talk about 911 in a second. But, yes, the answer to your question is you call 911. Um, about the solicitation, there's been, there's been several questions that I received about the solicitation ordinance that the township has. Um, I think it was, a, was about two, three years ago. Two, three years ago, um, we were presented with an issue from our solicitor um, that there was a, there was a challenge to our prohibitive solicitation ordinance. And um, with that challenge, he brought to us, the Board of Commissioners, a uh, backlog of case law um, that went through the court systems about prohibitive ordinances for solicitations, door-to-door -door solicitations, that, that having a blanket prohibit prohibition is unconstitutional. Um, and because of the potential challenge, he requested, he, um, asked the board to consider changing the door-to-door -door solicitation ordinance, which we debated, I mean, a couple meetings, correct, Chief? Um, and change the ordinance uh, to allow for door-to-door -door solicitations with the, re with the uh, restrictions that we felt would be applicable, um, that, w that would be applicable through the court systems that would be allowable to have certain restrictions on the, to have permits, to give fees for, for commercial door-to-door -door solicitors that are not registered with the township. Um, we, can't reach, we can't require permits for religious organizations or political organizations. Um, so we do, have, we, we do allow door-to-door -door solicitations. Um, one of the questions came up, can we, can we restrict them in, in neighborhoods or anything like that? There, there's, no, there's no ability to do that. Um, we've been told time and time again, um, both from our solicitor our previous solicitor and our current solicitor, um, that that is just, it's, it's just not a possibility. We open ourselves up to challenges, and there have been challenges throughout the Commonwealth on door-to-door -door solicitations or prohibitive door-to-door -door solicitation ordinances. So I just wanted to bring that up to you because that was a question. Ma'am, uh, hold on. Let me give you the microphone. Um, there's the decals that you can get that say no solicitation, and it tells you that that they that they can't knock at your doors, and it's a dollar contribution downstairs, and the, and it goes right on your screen door. And since I've had it on there, nobody has knocked on my door at all, and I see them walking by my house. When when they receive a permit, there's two things that you can do. You can sign up for a do not solicit um, on the police department's website, correct? Within, within the same thing that uh, Deputy Chief Living Good showing here, you can sign up, do not solicit. So solicitors will be given that list. Also, if you post on your property no solicitations, they need to honor those. If they show up and you call the police and they've shown up to your house, they could be fined for that. So there are some restrictions within the door-to-door -door solicitation um, ordinance that they do have to abide by. Um, I think so. I'm going to let Deputy Chief go on. Yes. Wait, wait, wait. Let me give you the mic. On the, on the issue of solicitation, I just want to present another view because I studied this very deeply when it first was uh, presented. And uh, the, the first thing is that the police did, there was case law that allowed the police to put in whatever measures they needed for safety. But our police police chief at the time did not say, and Chief Kelly's here, um, but he did not say that it was unsafe. And I asked him even later to say that it was unsafe. And there was case law that said when you need to apply safety that there are laws that allow you to put the measures in place that you need. So that's number one. And, and number two is one of the reasons that the businesses get these laws passed is because they all go to the courts to ask and nobody's there to represent us. We're all busy at work and the people that we elect and that we hire are the only people that can go and represent us. So if they say we've been challenged, we just have to give in, then the law goes in the favor of the solicitors. 
My recommendation um, that I made several times was to get many municipalities, almost every resident I have spoken to in a residential district does not want to have commercial activity in the residential districts because it's unsafe and it interrupts the quiet, peaceful enjoyment of our homes. And we do have constitutional rights in that regard, but we do need our elected and paid officials to represent us in those matters. And the only way to do it would be not for one township to take on the big corporations, but for us all together to do that. And so I would ask you as a group to do that with the other communities. Thank you. So I'm going to let Chief answer in a second, but sure. give me one minute. Um, so I just I want to be clear about something. When we went through the door-to-door -door solicitation, there were a lot of conversation among the Board of Commissioners, not without any stone unturned. Um, every, every case that was brought before any court, whether it went all the way, through, I think the case we actually looked at specifically was a case in New Jersey that went all the way to, went to the Jersey Supreme Court or even federal, whatever it was. It went, it went pretty high up in the courts. All of those ordinances were defended by municipalities. They were defended, they were authorized to be defended by the municipalities through their legal representation, whether it's their actual solicitor or special counsel. So to say that the, they just went to a court and got it because they're a business and they were the only ones that showed up is just not the case. All these cases were defended and because of constitutional issues that were brought up, the, the presiding judges or panel of judges struck down the prohibitive ordinances and put opinions down that allow for door-to-door -door solicitations to have some pro some restrictions, but we, but townships could not have prohibitive ordinances. So to say that they weren't defended is they were defended, um, and there is numerous case law in this. So as far as the comments about Chief Kelly, I'll let him respond to that. Yeah, I, I'm not going to get into a, an argument with one of the citizens. Uh, I will tell you that. Um, if there's any ability to stop solicitors coming into our township, I will absolutely do whatever possible to stop them. I didn't want to let them in to begin with. Um, we, we, we felt that we absolutely, the, the board absolutely had to change the law after advice from numerous um, solicitors and also every other community that I'm aware of made those same changes because we were forced to by the law and by court decisions. And uh, however, if there's ever a time when we can tighten it up in any way, and absolutely, if we can absolutely prohibit it, I will tell you emphatically and without any question, without any equivocation, I will absolutely prevent them from coming into our town. Uh, there's nobody in this town that wants to keep them out more than I do, but uh, obviously the board has to follow the law as well. And with those court decisions and with the advice of our attorneys, they went along with that. We're constantly monitoring that. And if we have a chance to change it and tighten it up because of a court decision that allows us to do that, we will do that. And I'll add one other thing. I mean, I think it may be the case that the courts have opened up the ability for townships to prohibit door-to-door -door solicitations if there are security risks or criminal risks. I mean, I, as a board member, I haven't heard of any large amount of, case, of criminal cases that we've been able to link back to door-to-door -door solicitations in any way, shape, or form. We would have to have that evidence to be able to add in a prohibition to door-to-door -door solicitations on those grounds. And as a board member, and I don't think, you know, I've been around through the whole thing with the door-to-door -door solicitations, I haven't heard anything from the police department telling us that there's a there's a crime issue with door to door solicitations. We should take a look at a prohibition for that. So I'm going to give it back to you. Um, go ahead. If we get one of the stickers that uh, she mentioned to put on our door, does that mean that even the religious groups and the others, nobody is allowed to come in and bother you, or uh, it doesn't affect the religious groups that you said have an exemption and they don't need permits? Political groups, things like that. I believe it stops everyone. I believe so. Is that correct? Yes, it is. Yes. It does. 
Yeah, the way the ordinance is written, if, and I think Chief is correct, I don't have it committed to memory, but the way the ordinance is written, if you have a no solicitation um, symbol on your door or the sticker, you don't have to buy the sticker, you can get it. It has a police emblem, so it may deter people a little bit more than just a sign that says no solicitations. Um, they're, they're abide to, to, they're, they're required to, to abide by their, by your wishes and not solicit, regardless of what it is. And once again, um, back to the question over here. Um, 911, everybody thinks it's, a, it's an emergency number, and we talked about it. We were going to bring this up before, uh, later. 911 should be used any time you want an immediate response. So that doesn't necessarily mean somebody's arm has to fall off or somebody's in a house or there's a fire. Um, it means if there's a door to door, if there's a solicitor at your house and you don't you don't, they don't have a permit or you're concerned about whether they have a permit or you're not even sure that they have a permit or you're not even, you don't think they should be there, call 911. 911 is when the county uh, took back the 911 call center. We used to have our own call center. The nine, uh, now it's all centralized at the county in Eagleville. Um, they also do all the initial dispatching. So when you call 911, even the Abington Police Department is initially dispatched from Eagleville. So that's why we tell you, if you want an immediate response to anything, forget about the word emergency. If you want an immediate response to anything, call 911, okay? So that's key to remember. So anything you see, if you see a suspicious car, call 911. If you see a solicitor and you're not sure they should be there, call 911. You should erase the idea that this is an emergency call number and remember it as anything you want with an immediate response. So I'm going to give it back to the Deputy Chief and we'll get back to questions. Okay, thank you, Commissioner. Um, just wrapping up on this, and I don't want to spend too much of your time here, but there's resources, there's other things you can look at in there. Uh, we looked at this um, permits things. Um, the Commissioner mentioned that, and the applications are on here. The no solicitation windows claims are on here. You can do it all right from here. There's one other thing that I want to show you there that we think is pretty important, and that is an away home notification. You're going to the shore, you're going to Florida, you're going to be away for two weeks, your house is going to be vacant. It's a good thing to give us that information. It's held confidential, but the beat officer out there in your area will be made aware of it to keep an extra check on your house. In fact, it has room for you to put on there comments about there's a car in the driveway, should be nobody there, there might be a red car there visiting from time to time. It allows us to have that information that will really enable us to protect your property a little bit better. So there's a lot of things on this website that can really be beneficial to you. And I'm going to talk about a case. Somebody asked about Meadowbrook Apartments. There's How does this stuff that's going on there affect you and your neighborhood? And of course it does. It's not far away. I told you that crime is really not localized. It goes beyond those borders. And certainly there's a lot going on in Meadowbrook Apartments. Um, recently, we've had a couple of vehicles stolen from there. And um, I'm going to go to the news link here, going down to the press releases that we have out there, and going down to February the 5th, this one right here. And that's a little bit small for you to read, but I can tell you that in the wee hours of February 5th, our officers out there on patrol up in the Huntington Valley section, up in Chapel Hill, spotted some guys, a young woman and um, two guys, that were out there in the middle of the night, obviously up to no good. They tra tracked them down, they took off, they caught them, captured them, brought them in, and um, they were charged criminally, obviously, with a number of cars that were entered in that Chapel Hill area that night. Um, so yes, it does go beyond your area, and uh, we um, consider what happens in Meadowbrook Apartment to be connected with, as you can see, up in Chapel Hill, and possibly in your area as well. And now. Commissioner, I want to go back to the, um, if I could, to the PowerPoint. Okay, that's good. Okay, so we talked about Meadowbrook's apartments, our investigative procedures, um, and prioritizing investigations. Uh, we, I think we've talked about everything. We got right down to the bottom of that page. And I told you we would come back to that, getting back to crime victims. Uh, we'd like to think we do a pretty good job on that. We realize we could probably do a better job. Um, there's probably room for improvement. But let me just tell you about some of the ways that we do it. 
First of all, we have what we call a victim service liaison unit. This consists of volunteers who call up crime victims after the fact, make sure that they're aware of their rights and how they could possibly be, be um, compensated by the Crime Victims Compensation Act. Um, I'm going to pass these out to you. Okay. This is something that our officers, the patrol officers, when they take a crime report, we require them to give one of these to the victim. And when you get it, you will see that on the front of it, it has room for the officer's name, the case number, so you know the case number, and it has all the contact information in there. And that pamphlet explains to you your rights as a crime victim. And it explains to you um, some of the things that you should be considering. Um, so you should receive one of those. We require the officers to document that on their offense report that they have given that out to the, to the victim that they received it. Obviously, if it's a business, we don't give it out. If nobody's home, we don't leave one there. Uh, but we give those out to every victim that we come in contact with. Um, the crime, the victim's liaison, um, those volunteers will then follow up with a phone call, make sure you don't have any questions, and they do a great job. These are volunteers that come in, um, staff that office, and they really do a, a bang-up job for us. We really appreciate their services to us. One of the great um, groups of volunteers that we have here in Abington Township. And then there may or may not be follow-up from the officer to detective. Probably an area we could do a little bit better in. Um, we don't always get back to you. We understand that. Um, but again, we're, 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 we're carrying pretty heavy caseloads. And we kind of leave this information with you and um, suggest that you get in touch with us. Obviously, um, if something significant happens in your case, if we make an arrest, if we clear the job, we will get in touch with you and let you know what we need from you as far as court, et cetera, those things. This is um, two versions of the pamphlet you have in your hand. We also have that available in Spanish. If the people don't speak English, we have those available to our officers as well. And um, they're carried in every police car. And like I said, these are given out to every single crime victim. You need to contact us. You have a number of options. As the commissioner pointed out, most important, 911, always think in terms of that. If you want an immediate response for any reason, fire, police, um, you have somebody hurt, um, you see something you think is suspicious, you want a police car out there, then 911 is the number you want to remember. It's easy to remember. Just pick that up and dial it. If you want to call us for just some routine matter and um, it really doesn't rise to what you want to contact 911 for, um, that 267-536-1100 um, comes into our police department. That's our automated number, and there is a number of options on there, and it'll say, the operator will say, for non-emergency police information, select or press number three, I think is the way it reads. And that'll take you right... Yeah. That'll take you to our, um, right into our radio area where our um, people who monitor our radio and our computers work 24 hours a day. So you'll be talking to somebody right here in Abington, and you can try to get them to direct you or take care of your concern through that. So that's for routine things that don't require an immediate response. And then obviously for detectives, you can select number four. For records, five. You can read the rest on yourself, whatever um, department you're looking for in a township. Um, all of us have direct dial extensions, including the police officers. Now understand, they work a 12-hour shift, and they're off as much as they're on because of those long shifts. And um, so when the officer leaves his number or leaves you his business card with his phone number on, if you dial that extension, almost certainly you're going to get his voicemail. And we try to make sure that they, they respond to them in a timely fashion, but it doesn't always happen with the, the shifts that they work. Um, so there's a couple of ways that you can contact us. Oops, go back one. Yeah. <clears throat> couple more. We have a tip line. You can call that number at any time anonymously when we've had um, a rash of things going on. People have taken advantage of that. Sometimes um, some of the stuff going on with kids at the school, we get some um, numbers called in on that, and that is monitored. Um, you can also contact us anonymously. People say, well, you know, I don't want to. 
I don't want to leave my name. I don't want to have to, you know, any of those things. Um, so if you go on that same web page, there's a facility on there. You can find it rather easily. Contact us. And there is a thing on there called an anonymous um, email. You send that in. You don't have to put any information on there. We'd like you to because we can't get back to you if you don't. But you can send it in anonymously. And there's four of us that monitor that on our phone. So we get those on a pretty frequent basis. However, don't use that if you want something, something's going on now, don't use that. And a number of people have um, unfortunately done that. So if there's a suspicious car in your neighborhood, don't send it in anonymously there. Um, you can call our numbers and you don't have to leave your name. If you call 911, um, of course it's tracked and um, whatnot to know where it came from. But if you call that 267-536-1100 uh, number, Number three, um, you can say, I don't want to give my name. I care not to give my name, but uh, here's what I want to tell you. And the officer, they'll take that information from you anonymously. They will not force you to give your name. It's up to you. And, of course, you can contact any of us directly by email or phone. And um, and I just want to, before I wrap up my portion of this, I want to mention two other things. We're well, going back to the solicitors. And um, this gentleman back here, he brought me in a flyer, and um, I think it was, yeah. So he brought in a flyer that was left at his house by um, a guy that was coming around about two weeks ago, and he was um, putting flyers on houses, knocking on doors for college painters or something of that nature. Had his picture on the thing. When we investigate those burglaries on Londonderry and Morden Road, um, lo and behold, we found a lot of the houses in that neighborhood had those flyers. And we talked to some of the residents in the area that he had actually knocked on their door. Um, so we investigated that. Uh, we wanted to make sure or see if there was any possibility, number one, he was connected with a crime, and number two, if not, if he was at least a witness that had seen something else. We did investigate him, followed him out. That was a legitimate individual. And um, we talked to him and interviewed him. We checked all the phone numbers on there. They were not bogus numbers. They did go to a painting company. And um, he's a student at Penn State main campus. And uh, we ran that thing down. So we do follow up on each and every one of these um, soliciting um, calls that we get. Yes, sir. The uh, people who throw a plastic bag with a rock in it on your driveway, that's considered a solicitation, right? Yes. And uh, people who put things in the side of your mailbox between the mailbox and the flag, because we see, we see quite a few of those. So they're all considered solicitations. Yes. And um, I guess, you know, from what Chief Kelly said earlier, I guess you, you both agree that if we could limit the solicitations, we'd be safer than we were when we just let people come in and solicit and take the risk of a hundred dollar fine. I mean they know when they see they see that rock and that plastic laying on your driveway a few days later or a week later, they know nobody's home. I mean it's a pretty open invitation. Yes. So I would agree with your assessment that when something's a flyer or something's left in your driveway and not picked up, that that's one indication people could use. Same way, if you leave your newspaper out there, if your mail is uncollected, all of those things would certainly be that. Um, right. Oh, I agree with you. I agree with you. Yeah. Um, that pretty much wraps up my portion of this thing. Um, I've left a number of cards up there. Yes. I'm sorry. So we'll go back and forth to slides if anybody needs to. So we'll pass the, pass the microphone. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> we'll pass around. Um, you didn't mention, and I'm hoping because there are any of these break-ins when people are home, is there any evidence that people are being hurt or that they're carrying guns or that they, if somebody walked downstairs, there would be something violent or you, nothing was mentioned. I don't know what level that becomes on the definition scale, an attack, an assault. Okay, so the question was about, I had mentioned, I hit on it, and I told you I'd come back to it, I never did, was those late-night occupied house burglaries. Are they dangerous? Um, are they going to beat somebody up? Are they going to assault somebody? 
And to tell you the truth, we don't know the answer for sure to that. But I would say this, that anybody who breaks into a house or enters a home knowing that there are human beings in there sleeping is, knows that they're taking a tremendous risk. And I would have to consider them to be extremely dangerous. Um, that's something, that, and one of the reasons that we take that crime so seriously. Let me just, I told you I'd come back to that. Let me just finish up with this, talking about those crimes. Um, these happened back in around 2009, 2011. We had a rash of them. A lot of them were over in my neighborhood at Lindsay Lane. And we noticed one thing, that they seemed to have a nexus to a regional rail line. Um, not necessarily a station, sometimes a station, but in most cases, almost every case, they're not too far from a regional rail line. And what happens is that they look for a house that has unlocked doors or an unlocked window. The most force that they have ever used is they'll slice a screen. If the um, inside window is open, they'll slice a screen to get in through the screen and then just raise the window and go up. People are upstairs in most cases sleeping. They'll go in the first floor. A lot of times they will take a pocketbook. They will take a wallet. If people leave it downstairs, they'll take some electronics. What they won't take is any credit cards. So that's what they're doing. At the same time, there's a, there's a chance that they will hit multiple homes in one particular night. So they'll go in one home. They're not happy with how much they get there. They'll go in another home. They will also, at the same exact time, go in unlock cars in the area. In two cases, uh, three cases that we're aware of, one in Bryn Athen, two here in Abington Township. Our most recent one was on Oakdale Avenue in Glenside. They actually take the keys out of the house and steal the car as well. Um, so they happened from 2000 to 2009, 2011. I'm going to say we had about 20 of them in that time period. Uh, most of them seemed to be centered there. There were some down in Jagantown Gardens, some over in Glenside. And um, those were the errors, but again, always a nexus to a railroad line. Um, this past July, July 2014, they had stopped all that time period. They started again. July 2014, we started to see these. And we had some on Morden Road out around Larmer Park. And uh, we had a couple out there where they actually stole a car. And um, that car was missing for a couple months before it was recovered. Uh, but at any rate, they have picked up. And this is not limited to Abington Township. In fact, there are over 120 of these that we're currently counting and following on this particular crime spree. And they extend from Doylestown down to Media. Um, that's, the, in, that's the range that we're talking about. Quite a few out in Radnor, out in that area out there. Uh, Cheltenham's had as many or more than we have. And Abington, Hatfield, Doylestown, you name it, they are everywhere. But again, um, the railroad line seems to be one common theme that we're, that we're um, doing. So along with the other burglaries that I talked about, the early evening ones, the um, Londonderry, Morden Road job we talked about, these are our two top priorities um, that we have currently in the police department. Chief Kelly had a meeting uh, just yesterday with every supervisor in the department, and um, we stressed these two crime trends are the absolute top priorities that we're dealing with in our department right now. Um, they have never yet hurt anybody. Um, there was one instance where they encountered a guy actually on the earlier crime spree, spree um, that I talked about on Lindsay Lane. And um, they hollered at the guy, kind of pushed their way out, and just left. But they have not assaulted anybody. But I would consider these people to be dangerous because of the very fact they're going in a house that is occupied. And we take that very, very seriously. So that's the, um, what we're um, dealing with with those. And trust me when I tell you that we are working extremely hard and putting a lot of resources into both of those crime sprees. And, um, and also, we are taking the lead on both of these as well. So, so that's, um, that's it. Um, we'll be welcome to take some questions if you have any and um, try to answer for you. comment about the crime spree. Yeah, okay. The, the two things that you need to remember about those crime sprees are that they're not coming into the, the nighttime uh, getting into the homes, except for people who leave windows or doors open. They're not breaking into these homes. They're going only to the places that have the windows open or doors open. 
So that's a real easy one to fix that and make sure that you're not one of the people that they're sneaking into your front, your first floor and taking things. Many times, most times, are things near the door, near the window. Some cases, they're just actually reaching in and taking them. But the point of it is that we haven't had one of those at nighttime where they've actually broken in anything more than slicing the, um, the uh, window there. So you, you know what to do on that particular situation. And the, the uh, other, other crime screen we're having is the one that's happening in the early evening hours that we talked about, the one that's on, um, on Mordon and the, uh, and the other ones that are related to that one. It's in the early evening hours. And what they're doing is they're using dusk, the nightfall, to help find their homes. And if you think about that, you can just drive down the street and you can tell who's home and who's not, right? Because the people that are home have what? The lights on, right? And the people who aren't home, many of them are not leaving lights on or putting on timers or things like that. It's really easy. You mentioned about things like rocks on the driveway or things like that. Those things also, those can be signs. But these are absolute signs because nobody sits in their home at 7 o'clock, 8 o'clock at 9, 9 o'clock at night, whenever time like, uh, the, the nightfall comes. Nobody sits in their home with, their, with, with no lights on, obviously. So no one is home. It's just such a flagrant sign. So the mo one of the most important things you can do in that situation is just get one of those cheap timers and put, put, it, put it on there to come on right before nightfall in a place where people can see it. And it, it is absolutely going to keep you from having to, to deal with that particular crime. That's how they're going around. That's how they're targeting the, the homes. Um, one of the homes that uh, was hit just recently, I was there and I talked to the homeowners. They didn't have any lights on at all, and they had an alarm system and hadn't put the alarm system on. And so, you know, it, they, we're doing everything we possibly can. We're asking for is just a little bit of cooperation, a little bit of help back. This is obviously isn't anything really major to put an alarm system on if you have it with lights. But the light is, lights are the cheapest thing. It's the easiest thing. And that, that's the whole determination on how they're picking the home. So it, it's something that you can do very easily and very cheaply, and that it will eliminate that as a... Um, as a problem, and uh, so it just went. And and the last thing is locking the doors and locking your cars. Okay. okay. Yeah. So we'll take questions, and just to get back to that, I actually had that incident happen to me, and I'll tell you what the police. This was probably ten years ago. Um, my wife and I and the kids were sleeping upstairs. They came in, took a computer, a camera, and stuff out of my my wife's wallet. We we're out of her pocketbook, and when we talked to the police officer, she told me the same thing that I probably think the police would tell anybody is, is actually a good thing that I didn't wake up. Because if you startle them, you never know what's going to happen. And as the chief and deputy chief said, they're just coming in for quick hits in and out. So back to your question. It's almost better that you don't either wake up or confront them. So we'll take questions. Um, just wait for the microphone. Uh, yeah, I have a question, and I don't know what uh, they do or don't do, but uh, like on our street, and I know there's a number of other of them in the area, we have a group home, and I don't know if they scrutinize the people that are employed there or not, but um, I don't know that it always seems like the best characters, and they also have friends that come from time to time. You see uh, cars that aren't that great looking, sometimes and I don't know if uh, they could be breeding or contributing to crime to any extent but I was just curious as to if the people that are employed in those places are scrutinized at all by the township or the police department. Well I can tell you this that um, you're not alone there's not many neighborhoods in Abington Township that do not have some sort of group homes and um, that's a law now. We um, really can't discriminate against those homes, and um, they have a right to be there. And I understand your concerns. There are some people that seem to come there and look a little unsavory, and you just, you just wonder about them. And certainly, we always take a look at those things. We look at everything in a neighborhood and consider all possibilities um, without, unless we have some kind of indication that they might be involved. Um, we really we, we consider it. I'll, I'll leave it at that. I mean, if we've had this conversation, I don't think to date there's been any definitive evidence of any of the things that you've seen here connected back to anything associated with the, with any of the group homes. 
right. in the township, or at least that I know of. That's right. So, We've had a and they and they have been a topic of they have been a, in, among the police department. They have been a topic of conversation, and they're always in the peripheral when something happens close to a group home, um, whether there has been some connection. But to the to date, I haven't been aware of any connection to to group homes. Have they ever run license plates just to see if, or you're not allowed to run a license plate? We are. We, yeah, we are. The question, uh, just so we get it for the video, the question was whether they ever run license plates. Um, we don't have. As far as the team to park along yeah. here, I, I know you're not sure. Yeah, they look like you're in the ghetto. Yeah. I would say this. If we had a description of a vehicle used in a crime that was similar to a vehicle that was parked there, we would certainly investigate a little bit farther. There would be an indication to do that. But as the commissioner said, we really haven't seen a nexus to this kind of crime from those group homes. What we have seen is a tremendous spike in crimes within those group homes, them assaulting one another, assaulting some staff members. We, in the other part, another part of our township, we have a large number of these homes that have um, people who are hearing impaired and also have some mental issues as well. And um, we have a tremendous amount of calls in those homes. But um, the homes you're talking about, I understand they're, some of them are unsavory looking. But we consider them, we take a look at that, and um, we're aware of them, I'll put it that way. Do you look at the backgrounds of any Not, we don't have the opportunity or the ability or the reason to actually look into their backgrounds. Uh, no, no more so than we do anybody else just because we don't like their looks, so to speak. So. We all understand that um, it's always a delicate balance with law enforcement. You try to do what you can to always make the community as safe as you can, at the same time safeguarding people's constitutional rights. So it's always that delicate balance back and forth. Our officers are very aggressive, though, at, at running uh, plates and things like that and checking things out. And I can tell you that in a lot of cases, they can go by and tell you whose cars those go with, even the ones that uh, are just sitting out there or whatever, and it's because they've checked them out. Not officially in some cases or, or that we're just out there, um, but they're just observing as they're out there patrolling and they know that that car is there between um, two and seven uh, most evenings and so on. And uh, so we do, we do pay attention to those things uh, as best as, as they can. Some question. You may not be aware, but in our neighborhood there are four homes that are vacant it's three because the owners have passed away and one that somebody's just never lived in um, two of them do not have outside lights at night two of them do two look occupied two look vacant and you can look in and see the houses are empty and to have four homes in one really very small area to be empty is just an invitation to trouble vandalism, graffiti, kids using it as a party house, whatever. is. And I'm sure they're legally owned. I'm sure the heirs are, one is up for sale. So the heirs are obviously trying to, to. Uh, that's sell. always a concern for us. But it's just a small area to have so many. Yeah, it's, I guess it's a sign of the times, but that's a concern for us. We've had a number of homes, um, we had four of them, uh, within the past, about a year ago or less, they were burglarized, they broke into them, they stole the copper pipe out of them, and then in two of the cases, they, three of the cases, they tried to set them on fire. Um, they put some cardboard on a stove, turned the stove on, and uh, fortunately it didn't get out of control. Yes. It is. It's a problem. Yeah. So let me uh, let me jump in because for the commissioners have dealt with this also. Well, I should say the code enforcement department in the township has dealt with this. I guess including the police department. Excuse me. Can we? So we can everybody can get information. Um, in the last, I want to say three four years, especially since you know the market crashed in 2008 2009. Um, we've seen a huge jump in vacant homes. We've seen a huge jump in um, homes that have been left to be to go disrepair or they haven't been keeping up their properties. The budget that the township has allotted for cutting lawns for property maintenance issues, shuffling walkways because the, the properties are vacant um, to keep the, pot, the, the sidewalks safe. 
they're either legally, well, they're all legally loaned in one way, shape, or form, whether they're owned by an actual property owner or they've been taken over by a bank. But they're all legally owned. I mean, so they all have some ownership. And the way the township handles that is we go on a complaint basis. If you see a property that has its lawn growing out of control, we call the code enforcement. You can call me. Call the code enforcement department. We'll take, we'll send notices. If we don't get response, the township will dispatch a, a lawn company to actually cut the lawn. We lean the property, you know, maybe five, ten years until we actually get restitution on the money, but we'll have a lien on the property. Same thing with snow removal if it's an unsafe situation. Um, yes, they are all legally owned. So, but there's, unfortunately, there's no requirement in the township that you have to occupy a home. I mean, I have a, I can name right off the bat probably 12 homes that I know are vacant and are paying their taxes and so on and so forth. So, John, you had a question? Yeah, I just want to touch on this topic with regard to the group homes and the people that work there. Um, you know, I work in the township, and as a requirement of my business, I'm required to maintain a license. I'm required to identify myself as a licensed business person. Uh, the people working these group homes, is there any effort uh, with regard to identifying who the workers in those group homes are so that we have an ongoing record of who? I mean, I had a neighbor down the street from me who needed a full-time caregiver, and her brother decided that there might be some benefit to robbing these people. And, and from what I understand, there was some physical harm done to the occupant of the house, and this was several years ago. Uh, and and so so uh, you know when we talk about these cars and and maybe a, to expand on that a little bit, there was a point in time in Philadelphia where the local uh, police districts would issue badges or little stickers, window stickers for the automobiles of the residents of that police district, so that when uh, the local um, police uh, patrolman was patrolling the area, he could identify a car that belonged in the neighborhood and one that didn't. And again, I, I don't know whether that makes sense township-wide or not. I did notice on your map when you had an indication of the, the crime township-wide, it looked like there's a lot of activity going on in the entire township, not necessarily restricted just to, to Ward 1 here. But, but I don't know whether there was any thought to maybe pursuing something like that as a way of identifying those vehicles that we know belong in the township versus those that don't. And then again, talking about maybe as a requirement, anyone that comes in as a caregiver or as a worker in one of these group homes, that they register with the township and identify themselves as such. I'm not sure. I mean, I could try to answer that question. I don't know if you gentlemen have an answer, but as far as the group homes, we can look into that. Um, they're registered as businesses. If they are set up as business, if they're set up as group homes, they're registered as businesses. So they'll be registered that way, whether they're employees specifically or registered. Um, I can't answer that question. I don't believe they are, and I'm not sure that we can require it, but it's a question we can ask the solicitor. So, and we can get back to you. Sorry for the long trip there. Uh, actually, I have just two comments real quick, and then I do have a couple questions. Uh, one comment, which is actually rather disturbing, is the one year to uh, get actual results out of the state lab. Um, so I don't know if there's anything. I mean, I know there's a lot of uh, waste in the state. I mean, you look at some of the um, politicians obviously have very large staffs, and I think we could take the money there. So I, I do think that I'd like to see either, A, the state actually dedicate resources to something that's important like crime, um, and or, B, the, um, the county may be taking the lead on that. I realize Abington Township can't, and I know you're doing all you can, but that's just a comment that we can't do anything about here. But I do find that rather disturbing if there's something we could do on that. Uh, again, even on the county level. I mean, I know we have a uh, what, commissioner of wills that decided to make a point of uh, allowing certain marriage license to go out because he figured he'd you know, let us do a lot of uh, money. But uh, that's a different point. Um, the second thing that I actually was wondering about, though, what the heck here is, you talk about being able to call 911 whenever there's an issue that we kind of feel unsafe about. I know you said, hey, if somebody has an alarm and it goes off uh, many, many times, you're not going to really worry about uh, billing them for that. At what point in time does, like, you're almost like crying wolf too many times. I mean, I'd like to see, you know, for example, I know the 
we have these uh, Jehovah's Witnesses or whatever religion runs around the uh, neighborhoods, and you know, I know that I've seen the police called on them, and you guys have been very responsive on that. Um, obviously, I know they have the right to speak, but we also have the right not to have them go into Laura's point, um, invade our um, peaceful enjoyment of our homes. Um, but I mean, at what point in time do you guys say, hey, listen, not that house again. Why are they calling me? Uh, so that, that is a question, if, if we could address that. And then the only other thing I had here, actually, this is the other comment I had. Um, I love that whole video you showed about the, uh, the airplane. Mm -hmm. um, I know we have a lot of street lights in there, and I know in Philadelphia um, there's a number of um, contracts they have where they have cameras out. I'm wondering if on street lights we might even be able to consider doing that on the cameras, if there's any kind of state grants or something like that that may be available. I know there's a lot there, but... So as far as the street lights, I mean, that's something we can talk to the... Uh to our streets department about. I, it's not something that's been brought up to us as far as an availability for those, but it's certainly a question that we can at, ask. Um, I'll just make one comment about the video. I don't know if anybody else here, and I said this to John, was anybody else waiting for the smart bomb to come in and hit the car? Because I kept waiting for that to come out of the corner. I don't <laughs> um, I don't, gentlemen want to answer um, the question, but it's, I, asked the, I asked the same question about the state police and and that situation. So I'll let them answer that question, um, address that. I just want to say I agree with you 100% and uh, had the opportunity to talk to the governor's new transition team regarding law enforcement issues. And I told them point blank the number one thing that the state can do to get bad guys off the street and they can do like right now is to put more resources there and to um, be able to speed up that process. So you're absolutely right, sir. You're right on target. It makes so much sense, and uh, and hopefully we'll see, uh, see see some changes for that. And I'll uh, mention one other thing along that lines. Um, Deputy Chief, there's a, there's a local company that does lab work out on, uh, out in Upper Dublin, Upper Dublin or Upper, Upper, Upper Moreland. Moreland, Upper Moreland, that they work through the uh, district attorney, the Montgomery County District Attorney's Office. Um, the one issue is they're not tapped into the CODIS uh, database. So if they were to do DNA, we may get it back quickly, but we won't get the full, we won't get the full scope of, of the DNA search um, like we would do, with that, like the police would get through the state police. So. Um, as far as the 911, um, I would say the, the cry wolf kind of thing, don't worry about it. The, I think that's up to the police's discretion. Um, but I would say anything that you require, that you think needs immediate response, even if it's three times a day, I mean, we, at this stage of the game, we would rather um, have people calling than self, um, uh, What's the word I'm looking for? So, yeah, or, yeah, self evaluate or, right. So if you have any inclination, call the police. That's what we want people to do. Sorry about that. And there was one thing when we were talking about the suspicious activity up there that, quite honestly, I just thought was uh, honestly raw incompetence on the part of my mailman. I do on a regular basis, on a, on a regular basis, get mail from places all over God's Green Acre. And I never would have even thought that that was something that was reportable. So I think that, I know one of the topics that went out in one of the emails I saw go out is, if there's anything we could do on something like that, I mean, I know the locking the doors and all that, but if there's something where it's like, hey, here's suspicious activity, like the, the fish man running around selling fish or meat or whatever he was selling. But it, to know something like that was a big issue here, it would have been really helpful. When, when the commissioner was talking about don't de try to decide should you call, should you not call, uh, I've said many, many times, and I mean it sincerely, I'd rather have 99 calls we check out and that there, there's nothing serious there than missing the one where we're able to catch somebody. And, and people say, yeah, but there's nothing you can do. And I want to explain this because it, it really makes a lot of sense when you hear the whole thing through. And that is, they say, well, but they're, if they're not doing anything, there's nothing you can do. So I want you to picture this. The person sitting there in their car and the, ci the citizen looks out and sees them. They didn't know they're not from the area. They wonder what they're doing there, so they call the police. We send a police car down there. Pretty soon a police car pulls up behind them, walks up, sir, can I see your ID and your, uh, your identification, please? Okay, thank you. Sir, is this your current address? Okay, is this your car? 
Okay, I'll be back, right back with you in just a minute. And if everything checks okay, you're, you're free to go. Um, it, it, where, where do you work, sir? Okay. And he's writing all this stuff down his pad. When he comes back, he hands the ID back. He says, uh, thank you very much. Everything checks okay. We just were here checking it because uh, the neighbors were concerned. Now, then he takes that pad, he wraps it up, and he puts it in his pocket. Now, do you think that guy is coming back to that neighborhood to commit a crime any time in the near future? Right? He's not because he knows that somewhere out there there's that police officer that has his name, address, um, his, his vehicle description, everything else in, in his pad. And, and he's not coming back. Not only isn't he coming back, he's going to call his friends that are criminals because they do have a grapevine too, of course. And he's going to tell them, please, whatever you do, don't go into a crime on that street because they're going to come knocking on, the police are going to come knocking on my door. So it really does help. And not only that, the police officer, by saying it that way, says a message to them that the citizens were watching and they called the police. The police immediately responded. And they know there's a lot of places they can go that's a lot easier to do a crime than a place where the citizens are watching where they're calling the police and where the police are responding and doing doing their job like that. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, uh, you've, been, you've talked about alarm systems being effective deterrent to you know, break-ins. I was wondering uh, what you think of like video surveillance systems in lieu of a of a home alarm, whether they're effective deterrent. I, I think they are. And as much a deterrent for keep your neighbor's house safe as your own if you have them on the outside. You're talking about the inside or the outside? Yeah. Outside, yeah. They absolutely are. I mean, but if you have them, I would just urge you to get them attached to a DVR and record them. You can keep recording over, but at least you ha will have something if, in fact, uh, a crime occurs. So, yes, as I mentioned before, everything you do to protect your home has a cumulative effect. You add that on top of that, you're that much safer. Add something else on top of it, now you've gone one step further. So that is certainly a good thing to do. So I just had a question about the, the um, you, you went over very quickly the, that you have a different uh, procedure each time for how far you canvas out from a, from a crime. But as neighbors, we've talked about this several times, and we're, we're not sure why you couldn't put a flyer two or three doors down. In other words, we think three doors down on either side, front and back, that those people absolutely are the most likely to have seen something and the most important to alert so they can protect themselves. And we would, I mean, this flyer wouldn't take, you know, a carefully worded flyer from your office wouldn't take any manpower or anything and could produce incredible results. We feel that there's something missing when it's not there. Thank you. And, um, you know, your point's well taken. Um, you know, we think canvases are important, and um, there are some circumstances when they should be expanded. Father, I would agree with you 100%. And, um, but every neighbor is not the exact same. If you go over there, that house in Londonderry, London there's only one house that's even anywhere within view of it. But your, your point's well taken. Um, one of the things that we are looking at is getting information on these crimes out to you better. There's a new system that the county is actually purchasing called Everbridge. And it's a um, kind of a reverse notification system that allows us to notify the entire township, certain selected segments of it, certain neighborhoods. We can draw a circle around a neighborhood and send out messages and notify people. Um, the county intends to allow us to use that to control that in our own area, as well as having it to alert the entire county when that's necessary. Um, the commissioners were actually considering buying it for Abington Township a couple years ago. That's how effective it is. Um, but when we found out the county was considering it, we saved our tax dollars. And my understanding is that we're expecting that in here by June. So that'll be one way that we'll be able to, like, blast out to a neighborhood. Here's what happened. We want anybody to contact us that's seen anything. We have, on occasions, when there's been a rash of crimes going on in the neighborhood, we've had our volunteers made up flyers, had them go door to door, deliver the flyers, and, and trying to, to generate some interest that way. But your, your point's a good one, you know, that um, there is a lot of value in neighborhood canvases. And, uh, you know, I guess we should always consider doing more rather than less. And uh, so I'll leave it at that. 
One thing I wanted to say about that as well is that there's sometimes an assumption, well, geez, my next door neighbor was, a, uh, was home was burglarized. That, that means that I'm at greater risk. And whenever we determine and evaluate that uh, an area is being hit, then we do exactly like the deputy chief said. We go out and put out flyers and warn people and notify people. But in most cases, just because your next door neighbor was hit and burglarized does not mean that the chance of you being burglarized goes up. In fact, the exact opposite is true. Chances are they're not going to come back to that same neighborhood any time in the foreseeable future for the obvious reasons. They have all these other areas they can go to and, and do burglaries. And as, as the, John was telling you about all those different locations where we know this one particular group has gone to, you saw how they, they did two burglaries in a relatively close area, but then they're doing them all over in these other areas. So it's an evaluation that we do. If it seems like anybody, any particular area, in the township is at an elevated risk for that particular crime. We do try to get the information out, but normally it's a very random thing, and just because there was one or two in your neighborhood does not mean that the chance for you being burglarized is increased. In fact, the exact opposite is the case. So it's just a determination we make, but if we think that there's that possibility, certainly we do that, and certainly your commissioner is great at getting information out. I mean, he's constantly um, pushing stuff out, and uh, we know that because we not only see it, but also because he's always checking with us about stuff like that. So um, that information is definitely getting out there when there is any of that stuff that we think would be beneficial to you. Thanks. Um, you mentioned that a lot of the crime, you sort of trace certain crimes to the train line. In our particular neighborhood, do you have any feel whether it's a local person or you think it's somebody coming in from the outside? Yeah, and if you're allowed to say. Yeah, I, well, I'll tell you that I, I explained the late night occupied house burger. We know that's not connected to anybody in your neighborhood. Mm -hmm. um, you so, know that for sure? Uh, we feel pretty confident okay. in that. Okay. Yes, yes. <laughs> um, but there were two burglaries in there. And they're the two on Lenore right across the street from each other that we just don't have enough information to say it's somebody from in the area or from out. Thank you. Thank you. So um, of the burglaries, particularly the ones where they enter where the people are still at home, how many of those homes have dogs? Because that seems like it would be a pretty good deterrent. Uh, you would think so, but um, we have seen houses that have a dog in there that just didn't bother them. No, I'm talking about a big dog. Um, there was a house in the earlier spree that had a large dog in there. In fact, two of them, they never even woke them up. That's as unbelievable as that might seem. <laughs> Are there any other questions? Well, with that, I want to say thank you for coming out. I appreciate you taking the time. Thank you to Deputy Chief and Chief, uh, Chief Kelly for being here. Um, you know, just follow the steps. Keep your cars locked. Keep your houses locked. Set your alarms if you have them. And by all means, use 911 whenever you feel the need to. You need an immediate response. It's most important. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you.